is a comfort to my soul Your word is the truth that sets me free Well hi there and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity brought to you by Bible Talk as we come to a conclusion in our study of the letter of James. This is our 17th week, so we've been doing this for just, I guess, over four months. Uh, there's a lot in the letter. There's a lot in the Word of God, I promise you. Yeah, and, we and found it, that there's a lot in just one verse, <laughs> one word. And it is all worthy of our contemplation and attention. Amen. So this will be, but this will be the end of the letter of James in this study, all right? Um, we actually only have two verses left in the fifth chapter, the last chapter, and that's verses 19 and 20. So we're going to get into that and, and go over those two verses right after Alice prays and asks for the Lord's blessing on our time together today. Thank you, Lord. Father, we do. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. We bless you, Lord. We thank you for the precious word that you've given us, Lord, that keeps us in the truth because the word is the truth. And Lord, we just ask that it would touch our hearts, change our lives, and change all those who listen and hear your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you remember at the very beginning of this, James started by saying, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Well, the, the church all, all the time in the early centuries mm -hmm. was encountering many, many, many various trials. Yes. The afflictions of the righteous are many. Mm -hmm. Psalm 34. Amen. But the Lord will deliver us from them all. The, the thing is, the afflictions of the righteous are many today. I think we may not be conscious of what's going on too often. Exactly. And this is exactly what James is dealing with. When he says, if any among you strays from the truth, that's his concern here. Right. Is that the body, of the, the early church even then was straying from the truth. So there's a lot of correction in this letter. And his desire was indeed to turn people away from the error of their way. If there's being straying from the truth. Now, let me just give you one verse to remember. Because Jesus said that if you abide in my word, and that's talking about be, living in his word, right. continuing his word. He said, then you're truly my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Amen. So being in the word is what you have to do to ensure that you're not being led astray. Okay? Because there's a lot of people out there that would try and change the truth of God into a lie. Yes. And the primary one is the father of lies, who is a liar by nature, right? Satan himself. Always calling, he always wants to call God's word into doubt. Always trying to call into question. That's how it started. That's how the whole ball game started. Right. Yes. When he confronted the woman in the garden yes. and said, has God really yes. said? Yeah. Of course, you know, as I've mentioned, all she had to do was say, yes, he did. And that would have been the end of that. And say, get out of here, you filthy snake. Because she had been given dominion. He, she and Adam had been given dominion over everything in the garden. But they didn't exercise that dominion. Oh, yes. And listen, you have to exercise the dominion, the authority that God has given you in your life. Amen. Amen. So I'm, I'm saying that this letter is a letter of correction. And we'll get into that a little bit more here as we go along. What I want to do now is, is do like a little conclusion and summary to this oh, four-month study, right? Mm -hmm. And everything, this is all from the letter of James. Because this, you have to know that religion, religion, unlike most people believe, right. is about man's relationship with man. Amen. It's not about spirituality. It's about man's relationship with God. That's right. Religion, well, it's in here, right? Definition. That's what James said in James 1.27. He said, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. 
It's about your relationship with orphan and widows. It's about the thing you're doing with other people. It's not about what you're doing with God. That's spirituality. And by the way, that is, I was going to say, it's equally important. Well, no, it's far more important. Because, it, you know, your relationship with, with everything has to start with your relationship with God. Right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, as we said when we started this, I, you have to understand, and I don't know the, you know, I don't know how much teaching there is about this anymore, that Martin Luther, who had been a Catholic priest, a theologian, a monk, and a teacher in a, a, of theology in a Catholic university, he is the one that brought about what we call the Protestant Reformation. Yes. And that was about faith. Mm -hmm. But it was at the time, if you've ever heard of the 95 Theses, mm -hmm. which is what started this the whole ball rolling, that was about indulgences. Right. Indulgences was a practice of, no, I, excuse me, it was not, oh, was. Is. It still is a practice of the Roman Catholic Church that basically says that Christ's work on the cross did not deal with everything. It was insufficient. It was insufficient. Mm. So if you die and you have sin still on you, because you haven't done what the Catholic Church wants to confess to the, to the priest. You haven't been cleansed. Then you have to go to a place called purgatory. Mm. Now purgatory is in effect a temporary hell. Mm. Where you face the punishment of God. The horrible chastisement and punishment of God. Which he has reserved for the devil. <laughs> for some undisclosed, indecipherable period of time. Right. So, I mean, what a horrible thing to think after Jesus hung on that cross and paid the price for our sin and then said, well, it is finished. Mm -hmm. Now, here the Catholic Church is saying, oh, no, by no means is it finished. You know, you still have something to do to gain your salvation. So they came up with a practice of selling indulgences. In other words, you could, you could offer money to the Catholic Church mm -hmm in one form or another, do or do works in one form or another, that would reduce the time that your loved ones would have to spend in that place called purgatory. Right. And Martin Luther came to the place where he said, oh no. That's, this is, that's this is not in the Word. But, but you have to understand, at the time, that was a major fundraising effort by the Roman Catholic Church to build the Vatican. Mm -hmm. It was a fundraising program. It was definitely a fundraising program. So that means they put a contract out on Martin Luther. Mm -hmm. Kill that dude. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to get too much into that. But that was the beginning of something where Martin Luther, he started to, he started to reevaluate what he was seeing in a church. And he, as I say, he was a professor of theology, and he went into the letter of Romans, and the letter of Romans is indeed a letter of faith. So, so Martin Luther, in his study of the letter of Romans, saw that it is by faith that we are saved. Amen. It is by faith in God that we are justified and cleansed from the stain of our sin. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Well, the Catholic Church didn't like that, and they basically they put a contract out on him, and he escaped and got he he was taken in by the government in Germany and protected. Uh, but that was the start of this. Now, I'm, I'm just going to say this, and I say this, I try to say this in love, that I don't believe that Martin Luther carried that as far as it should have gone, gone at the time, because he still hated the Jews, mm. which was just a trait of the Catholic Church and certainly a trait of Germany right, right. that we felt the effects of in, in our lifetime with... Hitler. Adolf Hitler, yes. Right? So anyhow, so now here he is, and he's going into this, and he's talking about salvation by faith. So this is a letter of faith, all right? And that's about man's relationship with God, right? He said in James 2.17, Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works, and I will show you my faith by my works. See, a lot of people think that there is a bigger gap or a chasm 
between teaching of Luther and the teaching of James. Mm. That's just not so. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. I think one of the things Martin Luther called the letter of James the letter of straw. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that affected him was that the letter of James, as you can see, if you really looked at it, it's not a proclamation of the gospel. It's not a proclamation of how you get saved. Right. right. It's a proclamation of how you live once you're saved. Right. Okay. So it's really a letter of correction. And like we, I said before, the reason is that here James is saying, if you see your brother sin, go to him. Well, you better do something about it. Mm -hmm. And he, James was certainly seeing sin inside the church. Yes. Okay, it didn't take long for that for the error to creep in, unfortunately, more often than not, unnoticed into the church, as it still is doing today. The only thing that can keep you on track, in line, is the Word of God. That you line up your word, you line up your mind, you're being transformed by the renewing of your mind through the Word of God. Amen. Okay? Walk the walk. Amen. Yeah. So the Lord has established the relationship that we have with Him. Okay? Yes. He did it. You don't have to do anything. Salvation is the free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's right. The uh -huh. only work that we're supposed to do is to accept it. To believe in, in Him. Believe in Him. That's it. That's what He told the disciples. The disciples when they came and so said, what, 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 what must work. we do yeah. to do the works of God? Yeah. And, and He said, believe on, saying, He's basically saying, believe in me. Who the Father is sent. Who the Father is sent. All right. So we need to walk in that. Yes. And we need to work on our relationship with one another. Yes. Which is also sorrowfully lacking. We get plenty of opportunity mm. to put that into practice. It's not without reason that James started this letter with, Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Knowing that the, the, the testing of your faith produces endurance. Has your faith been tested? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I'm, I'm just going to say this, and I, I talked about it months and months ago. Uh, we were we were out of the country when the COVID thing really started back in the beginning of in March, and I came back and said, you know, Jesus, I believe that the Lord is coming back soon. I'm not going to put a date on it because you can't. I mean, even Nobody Jesus does. doesn't know the time. That's right. Right, the Father. but the fact is, it's Jesus had said, "When He returns, will He find faith?" Because it is only faith that is going to make you acceptable to God. Right. Well, how is He going to find the faith? By searching our hearts. Well, it has to be put to the test. Ah, yes. And it says, "Don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal that comes upon you for your testing." Mm -hmm. So during this whole situation with the COVID worldwide. This is a worldwide pandemic. I, I trust that God is sitting there looking to see if you are placing your hope, your trust in him, in him or in the world and the things of the world. Now, that doesn't mean you can't, you know, use the things of the world as they come. But it's about where you place, where, where is your trust? Who's going to save you? Who's going to save you? going to save you or the word? The world has never been able to save itself, yeah. Okay. All right. And of course, we have to be prepared for that. Yes. Considering that David had written a thousand years before James and three thousand years before us, mm -hmm. what I said in the beginning, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. How are we doing with that considerable joy? How, how are we doing that? How are we doing? You know, Paul says we exult in our tribulations. Mm -hmm. are, we, are we exulting in our tribulations? Are we considering it all joy? We should be, because we know that the victory has been won. Been where, does, where does the victory lie? At the foot of the cross. At the foot of the cross where the blood is dripping. That's right. Because we have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony, because we don't even love our lives unto death. Amen. That's where the power of God lies, in absolute confession and confidence in the work of Jesus Christ, not in the things that we do. And James does not contradict that, mm -hmm. okay? But he's not talking about getting saved because he is speaking to, to the saved, same, all right? Faith comes by hearing. That's back to Romans, mm -hmm. okay? 
Romans is that faith book, and I'll tell you what, it truly is. Mm -hmm. Faith comes by hearing, but then it says hearing requires speaking, confessing. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. Romans 10.10. 10. You have to believe it in your heart, but you also then have to confess it with your mouth. It has to result in that action, and then it has to result in more action. Because James makes it clear that the actions of the righteous must follow the confession of the righteous. Now, if we put the bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct their entire body as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so great and so are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. James 3, 3, 4. See, I mean, you see the flow of this in the letter of James. So the fact is, what you confess with your mouth is going to steer the direction of your life. And it better be stretching, steering it in a direction, in a path of faith. Amen. Amen. But that doesn't mean that the that doesn't mean you're being saved simply by the faith. No. Okay. I've had so many people say to me over the years, you know, we we have traveled much of the world teaching and preaching the word of God for more than four and a half decades. And so many people have said to me, as we've traveled, mm -hmm. teaching the word mm -hmm. over and over, they'll say to me, well, we attend a New Testament church. <laughs> to which I will always say, which one? Mm -hmm. Corinth, okay. simply immature, divided, mm -hmm. immoral, and full of pride. More adept at bringing the world into the church than bringing the word into the world? Mm. Is that the New Testament church you're a part of? Or perhaps the church of the Gal Galatians? They were foolish believers. That's what Paul oh, called them. Oh, you. Foolish Galatians. Who had come to believe that their works were more important than the work of Christ that he did on the cross. Amen. Our, our New Testament church, is that the church of the Galatians that you belong to? Perhaps the church of the Colossians, yeah. right? Defrauded by the false wisdom of self-made religion, not understanding the things that actually please the Lord. Yeah. Yes. I mean, these are the New Testament churches. Yes. Yes. Okay. Should I mention Laodicea? A New Testament church indeed, yeah. right? One that literally made the Lord sick to his stomach. The point is, led by the Holy Spirit, James is rebuking the believers that he is writing to in order to teach, to reprove, to correct, and to train them in righteousness. Just as Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.16. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. They're probably up there to, right now having a party and hugging each other. I mean, they are locked in together, right? Thank you. Remember that God's desire, spoken through James, who was moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God, as Peter said, right? Is that we be perfect and complete. And that is accomplished through the testing of our faith as we pray earnestly following the example of Elijah and, of course, Jesus, mm -hmm. which we are joyful about. That's, that's where we ended last week, right? Talking about Elijah, a man who prayed fervently, a man who prayed prayer, because he stood in the presence of God. He didn't just visit him once in a while. So this letter, in, in fact, is about, dare I say it, discipline. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. For they, our earthly fathers, disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciples us for our good, so that we may share in his holiness. That's Hebrews 12, verse 6 and 10. You see, 
We don't like discipline. I have to tell you, the, the world right now is so completely undisciplined. That's, it's never had a history of being good at discipline, right? No. no. But I think this is a particularly, since the end of World War II, the concept of discipline in the household of man, the household of God, has just gone south. Right. It's been, they stopped the discipline. You know, I, I want to tell you that in the, in the Psalms, I think it was David, who prayed that God would send people into his life who would correct him, who would, who would bring that correction, that discipline into his life. Yes. And he said, let not my head refuse you. Our great desire should be the discipline of God because it leads to the holiness or sharing in the holiness of God. But look around you. Tell me you don't see an un undisciplined world. You know what? Of course the world is undisciplined. I see an undisciplined church. The body of Christ. And I'm telling you that James looked around in his lifetime and he saw a church undisciplined. Doing what they wanted rather than what God wanted. And that was the motivation for this letter. Thank God for it. Hallelujah. Thank God for it. It should be our grand desire to be made more and more like him. Isn't that the wonderful promise of God? That, that is the ultimate promise of God. Again, going back to Paul. Because Paul said in Romans chapter 8, that whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. The only way that's going to happen is for God to remove everything in our lives that's not Christ Jesus. He's molding and shaping that, that clay. Absolutely. He is the potter and we are the clay. Praise God. But he's going to do that. It's not always pleasant to have something removed. No. Whether it's a tooth or a, you know, your hand, your hand or whatever. You, but, if you stop and think about it, the clay starts to go off and it's not conforming to the shape that he wants. Pow! It goes and slap right down. Back on the wheel. So we need to read the word and read the word of James and understand this is God's blessing to us. Remember what Paul wrote, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable. This is a God-breathed letter that is profitable to change us. We need to be more and more desirous of looking like, being like, acting like, thinking like the Lord Jesus Christ, not like ourselves. That's why we have, to, we have to die to ourselves. And we have to have that same attitude that was in John the Baptist. God, blessed man that he was. Saying, he must increase, but I must decrease. When it is our heart to decrease so that there is more of Jesus Christ in us and through us, reaching out to the world. I'm telling you what, you're going to start walking in the fullness of life. And remembering that we do carry the presence of God in Amen. us. We are the temples. And that, that's our task. Yeah. You know, that's what Peter said. I mean, there's no disagreement here between them. Yeah. You know, Peter said that we've been called out of darkness into his marvelous light, that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of that darkness and into his marvelous light. Yeah. We need to be bringing that marvelous light into the lives of others. But you know what? And there's one thing that God can't stand. It's a hypocrite. Amen. So what you proclaim, you had better be living. You had, and by, by the way, you can't do it. You can't live that you don't on, have on your own. No, you can't do anything on your own. But God didn't leave you on your own. He did not. For before he left, before he ascended into heaven, before he left Jerusalem, he said to the apostles, don't you leave here until you receive power. And on the day of Pentecost, the church received the power of God in the, in the guise of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You are, if you have accepted Jesus Christ, if you're reading these letters, all of the letters, mm -hmm. and you're receiving them, it's because you have been filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, the Spirit who was sent to lead you into all truth. Thank you, Jesus. This is a marvelous, marvelous trip that we are on. This is a marvelous, marvelous trip. We are called to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. This is what God is doing. He is working in us. He is molding us. He is shaping us, making us like his son, Christ Jesus. That's the plan that he has for us. Getting us ready for the homecoming. And, and that, that may not be too far off. And you know what? 
even if it's a hundred years now, you you know you're going to get there before the hundred years. Yes. Right. Yeah. So hallelujah! Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of death. Hallelujah! Because death has been conquered. Oh, death where is our victory? Death where is our sting? Jesus Christ, God the Father, raised him from the dead. And if you've been born again, you died. So let me give you a little homework assignment. Think about this. I will tell you that when Jesus Christ was laid in that tomb, that was the last, the final funeral. There aren't any more. Think about it. Pray about it. Pray and seek the Lord about everything that you're doing in your life. So, Father, we do, we praise you and thank you for sending the Spirit of truth into us, Lord. Yes. Making us the very temple of the Holy Spirit, Lord God. Giving us that, giving us that way, Lord God, your Son, who is the way. Thank you. That we might become like him. And, Lord, I, Father, I pray that it's all to your glory. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Lord, that everything that we do in our lives, that it's all for your glory. But it's all that men may see your presence and be drawn to you. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Oh, yeah. Amen. Well, I'm not sure what the next study is going to be. So until next time. But it'll be in the Word. Hallelujah. Remember, Jesus loves you a lot. A very, very lot. So until then, God bless you and goodbye. Tell somebody that Jesus loves him. Share the good news of Jesus Christ. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.